Anybody want to go to heaven in here? We ain't trying to take a load now necessarily, but somebody ought to be ready to go whenever God comes. And I just can't wait to get to Zion. Got a few more weary days and pain. I don't have to cry. I won't have if y'all ain't going to if y'all ain't going to church with me, I'm going to have my singles up. Yeah. 
Greetings in the name of Jesus. My name is Willie Rupert Jr., minister for the Central Church of Christ in Baltimore, Maryland. I want to thank Dr. Richard Barclay for the opportunity to be one of the speakers on this year is a car conference, focusing on the thing, the playlist taken from the book of Psalms. One of my favorite songs is 34 verses 1 through 3, where David says, I will bless the Lord at all times, and his praise shall continually be in my mouth, and my soul shall magnify the Lord and speak of his boast in my heart, and the humble shall hear thereof and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me and let us exhort his name together. I want to focus on the magnification of praise and illustrate it from the book of Revelation chapter 19, where the voice from the throne of God says, Amen, say hallelujah. We want to observe praise. Well, here's the message. Praise the Lord. Revelation chapter 19 verses 1 through 5. The Word of God. 
And after these things, he says, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah. Salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. For true and righteous are his judgment. For he has judged the great whore which did corrupt the earth with her fornication and has avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. And again they said, Hallelujah! And a smoke rolls forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four beasts fell down and worshipped God that sat on the throne, saying, Amen, Hallelujah. And a voice came out of the throne saying, Praise our God. All you his servant, and you that fear him, both small and great. Surely you have heard those who address the pulpit or sometimes congregational and make the statement, praise ye the Lord. It's with that backdrop from the text. You will lend me your heart and ears to this thought. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want to give you the meaning, the identity of praise. Then to share with you the instrument of praise. Then the invitation to praise. Why is God worthy of praise? It's in our text. See, the Bible says, and after these things, I heard a voice, and it said, it's a great voice, much people in heaven, and they are saying, Hallelujah! Salvation to our God. Glory and honor, power to Him. Why? Because He has judged the prostitute wrong. And He has punished her for her fornication because she persecuted the saints of God. And because now he has brought freedom to his people. The voice from heaven says, Salvation, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I want to borrow your imagination to help us to understand praise, worship, amen, hallelujah. For I know it's difficult for us to shout hallelujah. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Because of our culture. American culture. Because it seemed beneath us a freedom to bow down and say Praise the Lord. But I want to borrow your imagination. Can you bring up the picture of the elders and the beast and how the author paints the picture of praise to who God is? Can't you see it for a moment? For the book says there are 24 elders. Can't you see them around the throne? And then they are beasts. They have, if you read Ezekiel's account, Isaiah's account, they are four beasts. They got eyes, four wings, six wings, two that fly, two is here, and two covering their feet. And there are eyes that cover internally and externally all over the place. As they are all around the throne, 
24 elders take off their crown and they just prostrate. You're worthy. You're worthy. Can you bring up the next picture of the elders casting their thrones? Can't you see him? Prostrated. They themselves got crowned, but who they are worshiping is someone greater than them. Someone who is superior, who is sovereign, sinless. And so they show their appreciation. They throw off their crown. They prostrate themselves. And the voice says, say amen. Hallelujah. And they say, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Oh God, if y'all can see y'all selves right now, you're looking like, Can you bring up next the beast with all the eyes <laughs> in their wing? Can you see them? Two to fly to the color themselves and then two to cover their feet. Carrying the meaning of because who God is, he's too holy to hold sin. It's just like my goodness. Then the fly is as messenger. They like this flying, flying, whatever God desires. And they're around the throne and then covering their feet. You're worthy. Do you know who we worship? Do you understand who God is? He's not our boy. He's not in our club. As the heavens are high above the earth, he says, my ways are far beyond yours. All oh, the eyes, meaning God sees everything. There's nothing he doesn't behold. So the eyes represent everywhere. And can you imagine all around the throne, can't you see going back to the throne, there is a rainbow in the background. There is lightning flashing and oh how great he is. And they are all bowing down. You were there. You were there. Hallelujah. Salvation because of what he has done. What he is doing. And what he will do in the future. Now that's worthy of praise. I want you to note in the text. He can bring up the text. Revelation 19, 1 through 5. See, note the words in it. Hallelujah. The word worship. Praise. Amen. Again. Hallelujah. After these things, I heard a great voice of great people in heaven saying, The people, hallelujah. Salvation. Glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Note verse 2 says, Why? For true and righteous are his judgment because God is fair and God avenges for he has judged the great prostitute who wrong she persecuted the Christian and it seemed as if God was not doing nothing and the saint would cry you have to know what Rome did she even persecuted burned them at the stake burned them alive and as if God did nothing but God watched and he then judged and avenged now the people of God which did corrupt the earth with a fornication in other words her policies and had avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. God avenges. He pays back for what people do to his people. What we even do to other folk. 
He will remember and visit you for it. And then if you do well, he'll bless you for it. Listen to the text. Verse 3 says, And again, and again they say, Hallelujah! And her smoke rose up forever and ever. The word smoke have the representation as in the Old Testament which deals with the prayers when they was in the testament or in the temple and the high priest and then they were put in and the smoke would rise. It's the meaning of their prayers been answered. Verse 4 and the 24 elders the four beasts fell down and worshiped God that sat on the throne and they said, Amen, hallelujah. The meaning of the words is what I want you to understand. Hallelujah. Worshipped. Which means to prostrate. To lie as if falling to the ground, your head flat. Symbolizing thought that someone is superior. Someone not only superior but is also sovereign. Greater than you and you submit yourself. I know it's difficult for us because we live in America. The culture. Who bow down? But you knew in the presence of God. See, note in the text, if the 24 elders who have crown, who gave them their crown, and if they could bow down to him, if the beast with the 24, they with all the eye could worship and all of them say, Hallelujah! Amen. Who are we? <laughs> we'll be lucky to even live 80 years. Yet they live forever because they are spirits. Are y'all following me? Our consciousness of who we are to think we really are somebody when we're nobody. People who sin every day and a God who cannot sin, yet capable of sin, can't even behold sin. So the creatures, the angels, as the text said, let everything that hath breath praise the name of God. Because he's worthy of praise. There is no God like him. For no other God exists but him. He called you and I into the world. He made the world. He made the sun, the book says, Psalms 148, and the moon because he commanded them to exist. That's some kind of God. Listen what they said. Amen. Because the word amen means in agreement. <laughs> what were, what were the elders with the crowd and the beast in agreement with? It's what the voice came from the throne said, praise ye the name of our God. They said, amen. We're in agreement. The word hallelujah. means an exclamation of what's been done. See, what has been done? He avenged his people. And because he avenged and he caused them to suffer and gave freedom to his people, then the voice said, Say amen, 
Hallelujah, which means yes. I want y'all to listen carefully. See, no, there's not a difference in the level of praise as if those who say give God the highest praise think I need to teach a little bit help us to understand what you hear in denominationalism there's not in the text a level of highest praise to God the word is, amen, I'm in agreement with. Why are you in agreement with? Because of what he has done. So what he's done, I say, hallelujah. That's the text. Lord have mercy. See, I want to bring out what praise is and why we ought to praise him. Well, in the Bible, the New Testament, there are several Greek words for praise. Can you bring it up for me, please? Just like love. See, when you read love in the King James Version, it only says love, but the Greek word, there are many of them. Like the word agape love. Astrotic love between a man and a woman. Are y'all following me? Philly love. That's why you go to Philadelphia. That's the word. Philadelphia. Philly. Brotherly love. Love. Let brotherly love between us continue. It's understanding the word and how it's used in the context. To help you and I understand. And so we begin with the one, Alno, which is at the very beginning, hymnos. And that's how you sing, sing praises. Well, the word Alno is read in our text. I mean, only God is the only one who receives praise. There is no other God but Him. So the text reads, Sing, say hallelujah, amen to our God. Oh, there were angels, but they are not to be praised. Only God is worthy. For who else can deliver? Who else died on the cross and got up again to die no more? Only God. A voice came out of the throne saying, praise our God. Pray who? God. All you servants, all you that fear him, both small and great. See, remember, you remember what the angel said to Manoah when Samson was born? You remember, said to the father, and the father said to him, I want to fix you some food. And he said, don't worship me, worship God. You remember what John said? And the angel said, because he fell down before him. And he said, get up, for I am your brother as well. Worship God. Now listen, the hymno is the word interpreted as praise. You know the text. Colossians 3, 16 says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in what? Psalms, hymns, Spiritual song, singing with grace into your hearts to the Lord. Pray. See, what he says is, you and I ought to teach one another, admonish one another in some which is silo and 
and him. What the hymnology was right. And spiritual song, not blues. To the Lord, to sing, to praise him. Note the instrument of praying. Hebrews 2.12, I'll sing with my tongue, my lips to the Lord. Yeah, yeah, that's right. The instrument that gives praise for what he has done, I'm thanking him with the instrument, not an instrument that I play or blow or beat. The instrument is you and I. Giving thanks always for all things to God the Father in the name by his authority. Now I want y'all to listen carefully. Colossians said, speaking to yourselves in psalms, hymns, spiritual song, the verb singing, making melody in your heart. The word melody simply means thankfulness. See, if the word melody means harmony, some of us are in trouble. Because how many of us, some of us, some, see, some of us can't hold a tune in a bucket. Tell the truth, shame the devil. Some of you try to avoid some sin by someone else because they'll throw you out of tune. Lord have mercy. I need the song leader to be in tune so I can get in tune. The text, the text. Singing, making melody where if the melody is in the heart, then how does the melody flow out? You sing it. If you, yes, praise the Lord. Note that praise are expressed verbally in words, whether written or oral. Praise can be sung, sing praise, and praise is also applause. Let me teach you for a moment. We'll shout later. <laughs> Romans 15, verses 10 through 12 says, and again he says, rejoice, you Gentile, with his people. And again, praise the Lord, oh, you Gentile, and laud him. All you people. The word long in the Greek means is give him praise. See, sometimes you hear some folk, God is good. Some folk will stand up. Some will raise their hands. Some will shout. Some will just clap their hands. You see, God doesn't regulate your spirit, your emotion within you. Otherwise, you will be like Dr. Spock. Listen to me. So the Bible says when they hung him on the cross, and the sun refused to shine from 12 to 3. How that it touched the hearts of them, even the soldier. This must be the Son of God. On the day of Pentecost, when Peter stood and preached the good news, 
and said, you, take, you took him and you crucified him with your wicked hand. But God raised him up and the book said, and they were pricked in their heart. What pricked them is what they had done. It touched their emotions. See, all of us have emotions. He's not seeking to make you motionless. So the Spirit uses such. Don't you condemn what God doesn't condemn. He doesn't ask you, ask you to act like someone else acts. Maybe you can just stay there and the tears not fall. But other folk can't help but just to cry. Maybe what God has done for you, he has not done for them like that. So your expression of joy, you praise the name of Jesus for what God has done. Note, note if you will, the next word. Epipedon, which simply means to commend. For God's glory. For his faithfulness. You see, God commends us when we are faithful to him. When we go through our trouble and then we come out smelling like a rose, he commends. Look at my child. Listen to the word. Pray. He praises. Ephesians 1, 6 through 12 says, Blessed be the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who have blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ, according as he has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world, that we should be holy and without blame before him in love. Having predestinated us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, according to his good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. How good is it? He predestinated us. He chose us to be his people to his glory that brings about to show his grace of how good he is. Note the text, wherein he has made us accepted in the blood in whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sin according to the riches of his grace, wherein he hath a bound towards us in wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of time, he might gather together in one thing all in Christ, which are in heaven and which are on earth, even in him, in whom also he have attained an inheritance, been predestinated to the purpose of him who had all things after the counsel of his own will, that you ought to show forth the praise of his glory. He commends what he's done. You and I haven't done anything. It's what he's done. Therefore, we give him praise. Well, another word for praise is eulogel, which means to bless. See, David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mouth. My soul shall make her boast in the Lord. The humble shall hear they are and be glad. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. You see, during funerals, 
The word is eulogy. The preacher eulogizes, which means to speak good of. Even during time, bad time, difficult time, we speak good of God. God is good. And he's good all the time. Eulogize the Lord. Praise him is the word. But the word is eulogy. He's worthy. How many of you believe he's worthy? See the bottom line as I close. There are other Greek words for praise. But I want you to get the picture. Can you bring it back up once again of the elders and the beasts? How that the voice that comes out and it says to God's people, who have been persecuted, that John sees the revelation of God, how they have been persecuted, how they have been misused and abused, how Rome have destroyed them, yet they are now saying to God, how long, how long will you allow them to continue to misuse us? And he says to them, just keep quiet a little longer. Just be quiet. Shh. I'm doing my work. And when the time is right. And in this chapter of 19, finally at last, he rebukes, he avenges them. And then a voice from heaven, from the throne of God. Can't you see the rainbow in the background? Can you see the lightning flashing and the thunder and the rendering and a voice comes from the throne? Hallelujah! Praise ye the Lord! Say amen! And they all just fall down. What a word for the people of God. If you want to hear the full message, go to our website, Central Church of Christ, Baltimore. Remember, God is worthy of praise. Be blessed and God bless you. Hello, and welcome to the fourth annual Issachar Conference sponsored by the Stonecrest Church of Christ uh, and Brother uh, Richard Barclay, the founder and, and, and host of this conference. Uh, uh, thank you and, well, and goes out to you and the Stonecrest Church for having such vision, using technology in a positive way to reach more souls for our Savior, Jesus Christ. I'm Brother Gary Smith, and I am the minister of the Fifth Ward Church of Christ in the wonderful city of Houston, Texas, H-Town. Any H-Town people out there, hopefully you are. Uh, we'll say hello to you and hello to all those that's listening from near and from far. It's just excited, excited, and thankful for the invitation to say a few words speaking on the theme, the theme this year in 2024, Playlist, Studies in the Book of Psalms. Uh, Brother Barclay uh, asked uh, me and I'm sure the other ministers to for their uh, favorite text in the Book of Psalms and one just immediately came to me. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I use it quite often at funerals, but it's still profound even for any day and any time. And so I'll dive right in for time's sake uh, I chose the book of Psalms, chapter 90, chapter 90, uh, and the simple title of this uh, 
uh, discussion for a few moments is number our days, number our days. It's nine, Psalms 90 and 12, very familiar text. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts to wisdom. I took some notes just to stay on track. And so if you'll follow me, if you will, uh, your Bibles, hopefully you have them. I know you know this text, to number our days. What in the world, what does that mean? Well, not to count our days, not to count our days, but to make our days count. I just got a feeling, I got a feeling those that's listening, those that's watching this kind of, uh, some of you are old school. Uh, I may look a little young, but I'm not that young. I'm still old school. Uh, but Barclay didn't ask, he didn't ask me what my favorite tune was. I, I like this title, this theme playlist. Uh, I guess old school, my favorite artist probably would be Stevie Wonder. Yeah, that's him. <laughs> Stevie Wonder. I know you got yours, but I like Stevie. I like Stevie. But I certainly like the gospel songs from so many gospel singers and great gospel groups. Uh, at best, life is short. Wouldn't you agree? We are often disturbed when somebody dies at a young age. But when you really think about it, uh, what's young? <laughs> because God didn't count time the way we count our time. I mean, there seem like there are more people living to be 100 years old uh, today than ever before. People are living longer and medicine and other reasons, uh, exercise and just taking care of our bodies and getting off a lot of this medication People are eating better and living longer. But, you know, with God, is a hundred years is nothing. <laughs> really, you think about it, and when people die young, even children die, we cry bitter tears. But remember, and Peter, when Peter wrote through the Holy Spirit in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8, but beloved, be not ignorant of this one thing, that one day with the Lord is as a thousand years, and a thousand years years as one day yeah compared to eternity a hundred years old is nothing we've only just begun and then in the same text of the book of psalms chapter 90 chapter verse 4 it says but beloved be not ignorant of this one thing but one day one day for a thousand years in the sight of are but as yesterday when it is past as a watch in the night mm number our days. What does that mean? It means to understand how few they are and how little a while we have to live in this world. Yeah, it means to teach us to be wise with our time, to teach us to live with a sense of urgency, to live as though we have a deadline to meet. <laughs> One writer wrote this poem, it goes like this. It says, when I was, when as a child I laughed and wept, time crept. When as a youth I dreamed and talked, time walked. When I became a full grown man, time ran. And later as I older grew, time flew. Oh, I'd agree with that. And then he goes on to say, soon I shall find while traveling on, time gone. Mm. Well, what if I told you I would pay you $10 million if you tear down my house and build a new house, a new 3,000 square foot house, but I put a stipulation on it. It must be done in 30 days or less. <laughs> Yeah, you think you could do it for $10 million? I'll tell you what, I surely would be trying. Well, when we know by our days, we, we walk differently. Yes, we do. Yes, we do. I remember when I was playing football years ago, there was one of my buddies, he wanted to, he wanted to come out for the team, but he was so cool. He was a good athlete, but he was just cool. He walked cool, walked slow. And he actually got on the team, came on the team. We were, we were getting ready to play a game. Actually, it was a scrimmage game, and coach put him in, and he went to stroll it out there with his cool self, <laughs> he got in the hood, ran on the, with his cool self. I don't know what he was thinking, but he was trying to be cool and he got a delay of 
to lay the game penalty. The coach pulled him out of the game. He said, son, what are you doing? Because he was trying to be cool. Well, when we are numbing our days, we walk differently. Uh, the psalmist put it this way in Psalms 101, you know the passage, blessed is a man that walketh not in the counsel of the ungodly. When we number our days, we don't have time for foolishness. You know, foolishness, you know, things that don't really matter. You know, sometimes as a preacher, I know Brother Barclay can relate to this. And we get all kind of questions. People ask us, well, is it a sin to go to clubs? Is, is it a Do I have to worship every Sunday? Do I need to pray every day? Well, if you were working on my house and you had only 30 days, <laughs> you wouldn't be asking those kind of foolish questions. Yeah, if you were working on my house and wanted to finish it in 30 days, you'd be working overtime with your double time. You, you'd be more focused. And sometimes we, oh, we waste so much time. You, you, I, oh, I've been guilty of it myself. We, we waste too much time doing nothing or doing things that are, that are just, just not conducive to what we're trying to be. Mm. He goes on to say in verse 2 of Psalms 1, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. And in his law does he, does he meditate day and night. We're all your focus when we are when we number our days. When we number our days, we don't have time to waste. You know, if you're a married couple out there, you're married and, and, and we, you know, you we, we, we you, you won't spend a, a week not speaking to your mate. I I tell sometimes that well we haven't spoken in a week. What a week? What is going on? Yeah, when you when we number our days, we 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 we, we deal with issues and we move on. You know, when we number our days, we don't we don't we, we don't make every issue a life and death issue. We don't spend time, spend hours arguing over a dirty dish. Somebody left a, a, a towel on the floor. We, we, you didn't turn off the light in the bathroom and I'm just, you just make me so mad and so sick. <laughs> I know I have my pet peeves too, but I tell you, as I get older, I, somebody testified to this, as I get older, man, look at, I've got, I don't have time. Time to waste being mad at my wife. I'm sleeping in my. I'm talking. Oh, we don't sleep in the same bed. We, we, I, I'm sleeping in my bed with my wife every night. <laughs> Why? Because I'm trying to number my days. Mm -hmm. God have mercy. Help us, Lord Jesus. The Scripture would put it this way: Whereas we know not what shall be on tomorrow, James four fourteen. For what is your life? It's even up. A vapor that appears for just a little time and then it vanishes away. You know, when we when we number our days, you know, even sleep is not as important. <laughs> and I'm not being sarcastic, but but if you if you were working on my house, you know, that house trying to get those ten million dollars, yeah, you, you find that you didn't need to sleep as much as you thought you needed to sleep. Because you can't finish this house if you sleep in all the time. The Proverbs writer, he put it this way in Proverbs chapter 20, verse 13. Love not sleep, lest thou come to poverty. Open thine eyes and thou shalt be satisfied with bread. Yeah. It's, we have this more of a sense of urgency when we number our days. I mean, we wake up every morning with direction and purpose. We want to do it today, right now, instead of trying to see how much, you know, how much we can do. We go on our jobs and we try to see how little we can do. When we number our days, we see how much we can do in the lot of time. We, trigger, we try to figure out ways to just get it done, get it done, get it done. <laughs> when we when we number our days. Yeah, when we number our days, we also we we tie up loose ends. You got any loose ends you need to tie up before it's too late? When we number our days, we we do the undone. Yeah. We write that unwritten letter we've been meaning to write. We visit 
that person you've been intended. I, I need to go visit mama. I need to go visit grandmother. I need to go visit my friend. I haven't seen my friend. I, I, and we, we, we do the things. We stop making excuses. Maybe, maybe, I don't know. Maybe it's an apology that, that we need to make. Hmm. Well, yeah. Yeah, life is short. You just never know. You know one young lady left out of the house and the last word she said before she left out of the house to her mother was I hate you she didn't mean it you know you know kids teenagers you know yeah she said to her mother I hate you and oh my goodness I, this is little did she know she would never see her mother again oh my goodness man I mean when we number our days, we watch these words, we, 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 we channel these words, we resist saying some of the things because yeah, they do they cause so much damage, yeah. Yeah, we number our days, you know, sometimes we as men and women, business owners, I mean, we got all this going on, I gotta do this, I gotta do that, we don't have time for the we know my day when you, we spend quality time. Maybe it's not all of the quantity, but we spend quality time. Our kids, and you know, our kids, man, you know, my kids are grown. What they say, I say they grown, but you know, they still, they grown, but they still in your pocket. But, but, but our kids, they are babies for a moment and all of a sudden they are gone. You better spend some, we better spend some. Yeah, when we number our days, we cherish every single day, spend that quality time when it needs to be spent. Hmm. Yeah. Well, Jesus definitely numbered his days while he was on earth. He definitely numbered his days. In the book of John, chapter 9, verse 4, John 9, 4, the Bible says, I must work the works of him that sent me. While it is day, the night coming when no man can work. Jesus recognized that. Yeah. You know, if the Lord told us exactly when we would die, I'm sure we'd all be ready, wouldn't we? Uh, well, he doesn't. He don't tell us. He don't tell us the day, the hour that we will leave this place or something will happen to us. But he does want us, doesn't he? He, he warns us many times in his way. I remember my, my mother, he, she used to, she used to, she used to warn us on, uh, I grew up four boys, one girl, and my mother was big on cleaning up the house and big on giving chores. And she, on Saturdays especially, she would go make groceries and, and uh, she, before she leave the house, after we got old enough to stay at home by herself, before she leave the house, she'd always tell us, she said, y'all be finished with your chores when I get back home. <laughs> And she said that many times. She said, when I get back home. But she never would tell us exactly when she was going to be back home. And it would change sometimes. Sometimes she'd fold us and she'd come back. She'd stay home all day long, come back late. And we said, oh, she mama, she, she mama not going to be back today. And then she'd slip up. She, she, and sometimes she'd come back, look like she wouldn't be gone. But an hour, hour and a half, we scrambling, trying, <laughs> trying to get, get things done. We don't know when Jesus is coming. But on a serious note, when we number our days, and I, I, I maybe I hope someone young is watching this, you know, because I wished I would. I, I probably heard it when I was young, just didn't pay it as much attention. Uh, but I certainly, if you my age and older. <laughs> Life is different, isn't it? Yes, it is. I'm telling you, I find myself, and I don't know. I, I'm, I, you know, I preach at the Fieldwater Church of Christ, and I literally, we literally have a member or member's family die every week, and I'm either preaching or attending a funeral every. This is no joke. Every single, it's my burden as a preacher. I, you know, I, I, it's, it's, it's a burden, but it must be done. And so, yes, uh, maybe I'm a little bit morbid when it comes to this topic and I'm a little bit more serious uh, than most because we don't like the, you know, I used to wonder why my mother-in-law, my mother, you when the newspaper was out, I don't see too many people reading the newspaper now with the newspaper, like they be sitting there at the table reading a bitch 
<laughs> read the picture. I'm like, why do why they read the picture? And then I know now as I get older, because they looking for pe friends, people. I know so and so. Oh Lord have mercy, so and so, so and so. And and Lord, and, and, and after a while, somebody gonna be reading about us. But when we numb by days, and I'm trying, and I'm closing, I'm closing. When we number our days, shouldn't we certainly search the depths of our souls to start preparing as our day gets closer? Yeah. We, 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 we ask the serious questions. When I die, am I confident that I meet my maker in peace when I die? And for those, uh, perhaps, I hope this reaches the right person. Perhaps you're a Christian. Perhaps you were searching. Perhaps you in the in the dungeon. you in a dark place. And, but you know there's a God. You know you need to be doing things in a different way and be pleasing to God. Well, when you know your days, you, 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 you know you're out of step. You know how to get back. You know. It's not like God asks us to die on the cross again, but you do have to repent, turn from, repent of your sins, and ask the Lord for forgiveness. If, you, if you're a Christian, you have that benefit. If you're a Christian, you have the ability to, to humble yourself and ask the Lord for forgiveness. And the Bible says he's faithful just to forgive us of all of our sins. Luke 13, 3 and 5, I tell you, neighbor, except unless you repent, you shall all likewise perish. Yeah. I mean, even if if if, if you if you don't have a strong faith in God, uh, even if you don't don't know enough about God, if you knew that you had only three days to live, you would surely spend. Wouldn't you surely spend at least one of those days searching, trying to find answers to the real purpose in life, wouldn't you spend one of those days, if you knew you only had a little time left, wouldn't you spend one of those days asking yourself, when I die, what happens to me? Where am I going? What's going what's, what's to be? Is it all over? I spend one of those days. Um, well, unless, unless, well, I don't, <laughs> I don't want to be harsh. Uh, I, I let the scripture say it in Psalms chapter 14 verse 1 the Bible says this the fool has said in his heart there is no God mm, oh goodness uh, I'm not calling anybody a fool but the scripture says he that believes and is baptized shall be saved Mark 16 16 he that believeth not shall be condemned shall be damned yeah, when we number our days, praising God and having favor with all the people in the Lord added to the church, such as should be saved. Saved from what for years? Saved not from a spanking. <laughs> like teachers put you in time out. I remember in the book of Acts, the Bible, the Bible says, as the apostles was preaching to that crowd of people, it says, save yourselves from this crooked or this untoward generation because one day one day God is going to make all things right that's why he says number your days because when he calls us he's going he's going to make he's going to make sure that we know who the just and the unjust is and nobody's better than each other none of us are better but you act you acting kind of holy no the bible says all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God See, listen, this is the secret. None of us are worthy. <laughs> Absolutely none of us. I'm just a saved sinner. But the benefit is if you are, if you die in Christ, his blood continues to wash away all of our sin. No, the Lord didn't tell us exactly when we would die. But he does warn us. And I just want to leave you with this warning. That Jesus said in Mark chapter 13, verse 32, but of that day, and that I would know it, no man, no, not the angels, which are in heaven, neither the Son, but the Father. And he tells us, 
take heed, watch and pray, for we know not when the time is. Psalms chapter 90, verse 12. So teach us. We don't know it automatically. Teach us, Lord, to number our days that we might apply our hearts to wisdom. Shall we pray? To our great God in heaven, we love you and thank you for all your wonderful blessings. We pray to Father that the ears that have heard this message it has pricked their hearts. It has pricked our hearts and that we too will number our days and live in a way knowing that you will call us home one day. May God thank you for all your blessings, dear Father. In the name of Jesus do we pray. Let us all say, Amen. Thank you, and God bless you. Verses 1 through 13, Psalms 51, verses 1 through 13. Um, while you're standing, I got a praise report, um, and I got to go ahead and say it. Um, I didn't really let too many people know, but my mom, she was really going through it. Um, she's been in the hospital for a while. She was, um, it didn't look too good, um, but God allowed her to come home yesterday. And so if you see me walking around with a smile and a different glow, my mom is home. So that, that's a good thing. Uh, amen. When you, when you got it, say amen. amen. Here is what David says. He's praying to God. He says, be gracious to me, O God, according to your loving kindness or your faithfulness. According to the greatness of your compassion, blot out my transgressions. Wash me thoroughly from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against you, you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight, so that you are justified when you speak and blameless when you judge. Behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the innermost being, and in the hidden part you will make me know wisdom. Verse 7 is the best verse. It says, Purify me with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me hear the joy and gladness, and let the bones which you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins, and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the, the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a right spirit so I may teach uh, transgressors your way and that sinners may be converted to you. Um, that is the word of God for the people of God. This morning, uh, if you don't mind, I want to speak to you um, from the topic, I need a fresh start. But what do you do? Where do you go when you need a fresh start? It's interesting because we've all been there before. I would suggest that everybody has had something happen to them that has destroyed their very being. It, it has broken you to pieces, uh, whether it's a, a situation in, in your marriage, you're, you're broken into pieces, whether it's your child acting up, you're, you're broken into pieces. So you hear that somebody was killed in Mission Valley on Saturday that you went to school with, you're, you're broken into pieces. You turn on the news and see a genocide taking place in the eastern side of the world, you're broken into pieces. What do you do? This morning, I'm not talking about being physically broken. I'm not talking about being emotionally broken. But what do you do when you're broken spiritually? What do you do when you find out that what you're doing is not pleasing to God? What do you do when you find out that you're broken because you've broken the heart of God? Yes. I want to tell you this morning, if you don't ever think you've, you've broken the heart of God, Paul would say that all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, meaning that everybody here 
under the sound of my voice has been spiritually broken because you have broken the heart of God. What do you do? Where do you go? I would suggest to you that the prayer that David offers to God in Psalms 51 gives us an idea of where we can start. But in order for us to truly understand the 51st Psalm, in order to truly understand any Psalm, you have to understand the context of the Psalm. Can we have Bible class for a minute? Is that okay? Right. Because in order to truly understand the 51st Psalm, you have to take a journey back to the 11th and 12th chapter of 2 Samuel. It's very cinematic, if you ask me. The, 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 the events that take place in the 11th and 12th chapter of 2 Samuel are perhaps the, the most climactic story in the entirety of 2 Samuel chapter 12 and 2 Samuel chapter 11. It's almost like, has, has anybody ever seen the show on TV One, Fatal Attraction? I'm, I'm not talking about the show that comes on that's fictional. I'm talking about Fatal Attraction that comes on TV One. It's a, it's a show. It's a, it's a crime show. And it's, it's about two lovers and, and infidelity. And one of the persons in the triangle of love ends up dying. That's what takes place in 2 Samuel chapter 11 and 2 Samuel chapter 12. It's Fatal Attraction, Jerusalem. Let me take you to how this ends up happening. Story. <laughs> Babe, there's a knock on the door. David opens the door. He doesn't see anybody, but he sees a package. He goes and he opens up the package. He, he sees the package. There's nothing in there, but there's a pregnancy test, and it says positive. <laughs> and when he pulls on the note, the note says that, David, you are the father. It's his worst nightmare. It's, it's, it's his worst nightmare because David thought that he got away with it. It's his worst nightmare because David is the king of Israel, meaning that he is the closest thing to God, meaning that he is not supposed to sin. But here it is. David's sin has caught up with him. So David does what's in human nature. And David tries to cover up his sin. When I was talking on the parking lot with a few brothers on Wednesday, they brought it up to me. They said, this has always been a human nature. When you go back to Genesis chapter 3, when, when Adam and Eve were caught with their sin, they tried to cover it up too. And I wonder how many of us try to cover up our sin. Amen. David is concerned about his reputation. Yes. He's concerned about his identity. Yes. So he tries to cover up his sin. And so he tries to devise up a plan. He, he devises a plan. Yes. He asks for Uriah to be uh, sent back to him. Uriah comes to him. David tells him, to go home and to be with his wife. Next morning, David wakes up and Uriah is asleep at the palace, the door of the palace. David is confused because anybody in here that's, that's served in service, when you've been out for a long time, when you come home, naturally you would want to be with your wife. You'd want to eat some home cooking and sleep in your bed. But, they, but Uriah was a righteous man. Bible says that Uriah responds to David how can I go home and sleep with my wife and sleep in my bed when the Ark of the Covenant is still at war and, and my comrades are still at war? I just want to feel right. And so David says, all right, he, he gets Uriah drunk, tries to send him home again. Bible says that Uriah falls asleep at the palace again. And so now David has done all that he can do and he has to cover it up. And so he devises the ultimate plan to have Uriah put to death. So here's what David does. He, he, he gives orders in the form of a letter and he gives it to Uriah and Uriah walks and he gives it to Joab and Joab puts Uriah at the front lines and when the time comes he has all of the men pulled back and Uriah is killed on the front line. Joab sends a report back to David, no comment on what the report says, but needless to say it is sufficient to say that David's secret is kept because Uriah is now dead and he can take Bathsheba to be his wife. It's the ultimate fatal attraction. It would appear that that's the end of the story. David has successfully covered up his sins. But I hear the words of the old poem. And the song that we used to sing in church when I was a son, when I was a kid by John M. Henson. And it goes like this. All along the road to the soul's true abode, 
there's an eye watching you. Every step that you take, this great eye is awake. Brother McKenzie knows it. That's a, there's an eye watching you. Watching you, watching you every day, mind the course you pursue. Watching you, watching you, there's an all-seeing eye watching you. David had successfully hidden his sin from the people, but the Bible says that the thing that David did was evil in the sight of the Lord. Amen. And it's interesting because you can fool all of the people some of the time, yes. and you can fool some of the people all of the time because in the words of main ingredient, everybody plays the fool. There is no exception to the rule. It may be factual, may be cruel, but everybody plays the fool sometime. But you cannot fool God at any time. And let me stop right there because sometimes we do everything in our power to hide our sin from people so their opinions about us won't change. So that our reputations will stay intact. That we neglect to consider the one that knows all. And so the fatal attraction show continues. When you get to the 12th chapter of 2 Samuel, we're introduced again to the prophet Nathan. And Nathan is like a detective in the story. He's presented with evidence, but the evidence that he is presented with comes from an eyewitness account. But check it out. The eyewitness account is the God that sees all and knows all. So God tells Nathan, go tell David about himself. For real. Nathan goes to David and he tells David a story about two men. He says that there was a, a rich man and there's a poor man. The rich man in the story, he has all of these sheep, sheep on sheep on sheep, sheep in the house, sheep in the front yard, sheep in the backyard. But the poor man, he only had one little lamb whose feet was as white as snow and everywhere that the poor man went, the lamb was sure to go. The, the lamb did everything with the poor man. He ate with the poor man. He slept with the poor man. He was raised with the poor man's kids. The Bible says that he was like a daughter to the poor man. Nathan says that one, at, at one point in time, there's a traveler that comes into town and, and the traveler wants one of the, the rich man's sheep. Right. But instead of the rich man giving him his sheep, the rich man takes one of the poor man's. The only little lamb that he had. And this strikes a nerve within David because if you're familiar with the life of David, David, before he became a king in his earlier years, before he was a warrior, he was just a, a little shepherd from, from Bethlehem. And, and he stands up and he says, this man ought to pay four times what the lamb costs. He ought to be put to death. And I could imagine Nathan, as he just stares at David, he says, David, the man is you. The glove of guilt fits you. Amen. And then he, he, he has to let David know about himself because David was so quick to cast blame on another man, but wasn't willing to take his own blame. Amen. And I have to talk about us sometimes, right? Because sometimes we're so quick to, I wish I had my phone out here. We're so quick to, to pull out our phones and turn on our camera and, and put a flashlight on other people's sin when we should really be pressing a button on the phone and taking a selfie because we too are sinful. The audacity that David has. So Nathan has to take David down a, a, a trip down memory lane. He says, David, let me tell you what God told me. When you were a nobody, when you were just a little shepherd over Bethlehem, God took you and he made you king over all of Israel. When Saul was chasing you down like lunch meat, God protected you and then allowed Saul to kill you. When, when you needed something, God gave you everything that belonged to Saul, even down to his wife. He gave you the north. He gave you the south. He gave you Israel and Judah. And he says, if that wasn't enough, if God didn't give you enough, all you had to do was ask God for more, and he would have gave it to you. It was like a slap in the face to God. But before we cast judgment on David, if we just read the story, 
A text is like a mirror with our reflection looking back at us. Because when we really, truly reflect on everything that God has done for us, how he's woken us up every morning, how he's gave us safety from point A to point B, how he allowed your child not to be a part of a, of a school shooting, how he kept a roof over your head, how he protected your children, how he healed your body when you were sick, how he blessed you with a job you didn't qualify for, how he put money in your account to pay your bills, how he gave you a savior you didn't deserve, yet you still rebel against him. And so here David is. He's wrong God. And Nathan says, David, here's what your punishment is going to be. God will not kill you, but he still has to punish you. Right. Punishment number one, the sword will never leave your house. Right. Somebody was always going to be dying mm -hmm. in your family. Yes. Punishment number two, you slept with Uriah's wife in private, but I'm allow someone to sleep with your wives, plural, in public. And all of Israel is going to know about it. Wow. Punishment number three, and what appears to be the harshest punishment, but not truly the harshest punishment, he tells David that I'm going to take the, the son that Bathsheba, Bathsheba is carrying. That's right. And when you read this, you might say that that is harsh, but no. What is harsh is when we continue to wrong God after he gave us everything, Amen. and then we try to cover it up. And at some point during this entire situation, David finds himself in prayer. And that's where we get to the 51st Psalm. It's one of the most passionate prayers in Scripture. It's one of the, the most pain-filled uh, prayers in Scripture. As you read it, you can sense the urgency on behalf of David. You can sense the intensity and the passion as he is asking God for a fresh start. Some people think that the worst consequence of sin is the effect that it has on other people. I would tell you no. Some people would think that the worst effect of sin is the effect that it has on you. I would tell you no. But the worst effect of sin is the effect that it has on God. That when you sin, you literally bring God to grief. And so when David is confronted with his sin, he is broken because he realizes that he has broken the heart of God. It breaks David to pieces and his disposition changes from how can I cover this up to how could I do this to God? And I wish as a people of God, 2024, when we were confronted with our sins and how it grieved God to his core, that it would bring us to our knees before God. I wish that, that when we sinned and when we thought about our sin, it would bring us to tears because we think about how good God has been to us. It pains David so much that when he opens up the psalm, when he opens up the prayer, he says, God, have mercy on me. Be gracious to me. He says, I need a fresh start. But as we look through the prayer, David shows us a few things. One of the first things that he shows us is that in order for him to be given a fresh start, he needs to openly confess his need for a fresh start and accept the reality of his flesh being the reason of his need for a fresh start. All that is saying is that David needs to be accountable and responsible for his actions. Here it is. He opens up. He says, be gracious to me, O God. That word gracious, it's synonymous with the word mercy. It's David's plea asking God to give God something that he doesn't deserve. He's asking God literally to, 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 to be moved with pity on his behalf. He's saying, God, I, I've done something and I recognize what I've done and I recognize the punishment that I deserve for what I've done. But what I need you to do is withhold from me what I deserve. Right. Have you ever been there before? Yeah. 
what, what, what you're pleading for mercy for something that you got caught doing. I remember in the sixth grade, I got in a fight at school, and I got suspended. And it was right around the time of sixth grade camp. And my grandma, she didn't know I got suspended. I was just home when she came home, and she picked up the phone. And that's when the, uh, the teachers used to leave voicemails on the phone. They, they left a voicemail. I tried to erase it. It didn't get erased. She, <laughs> sin. She picked up the phone. She heard that I had been suspended from school. And she didn't say much. She just walked in the, the living room and said, you can't go to sixth grade camp. I had, I had been wanting to go to sixth grade camp since I was in the second or third grade. Uh, to go to Camp Palomar, to go to Camp Julian or wherever they went. And my grandma told me I couldn't go. And I vividly remember pleading to her, please let me go. I I'm asking for your mercy. When, when David is asking God to be gracious to him, he's literally pleading to God to withhold his punishment. That's right. But not only is he just pleading, but there's some intensity with the pleading. He's pleading in the imperative form of God. It portrays a sense of urgency. This isn't just a, a powerless prayer given by David, but it's a passionate prayer. He says, be gracious to me, God. And then as you continue to read through the psalm, he begins to acknowledge the reason he needs God to be gracious to him. His reasoning is in nearly half of the psalm. Here it is. He says, because he has offended God. Verse number one, he says, my transgressions. Verse number two, my iniquity and my sin. Verse number three, my transgressions and my sin. Verse number four, I have sinned and done evil. Verse number five, my sin and my iniquity. There is a sense of accountability on the part of David. Yes. He doesn't just say that he sinned once, but he recognizes that he continues to sin over and over and over again. Notice what David does. He doesn't deflect blame. He doesn't rationalize. He doesn't justify. He doesn't try to blame Bathsheba for his actions. He doesn't try to blame the person that sent for Bathsheba for his actions. But David accepts full accountability. And we can learn something from David in that sense. Because we as humans have a, te a, 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 a tendency to blame others. Adam blames Eve. When, when, when kids are playing the, the, the game in school, they, they're deflecting blame. Who, who took the cookie from the cookie jar? Not me. We live in a world that, that, that fails to take accountability. Uh, uh, schools that, that, that fail to take accountability. Governments that fail to take accountability. President 46, President 45, 44, 43, 42, all of them, they fail to, to take on accountability. Husbands cheat on their wives and blame their wives because they're not getting enough home, not enough love from home. Lack of accountability. Students fail in classes and blame the teachers. Lack of accountability. People treating people any kind of way and blaming the other person for their action. No level of accountability. And here's what David shows us. Before we can be given a fresh start by God as it relates to the deserved punishment for our sin, it is going to take a level of accountability. And that accountability has to be rooted in humility. That's right. That's right. And it's interesting because we can still learn some more things from David. David is not telling God something that God doesn't already know. That's right. But David is merely letting God know that he knows yeah. that he offended God. God, I did it, right? Because in order for David to truly be restored, his confession has to serve as the catalyst. And let me tell you something this morning. When we confess our sins before God, it's not on the basis of us telling God something he needs to know. Because God is omniscient. He already knows. But when we confess our sins to God, it is us letting God know that we are convicted by our sins. And I love what David does because acknowledging David, acknowledge, David acknowledging his sins is not just enough. When you look at verse number three, he says, God, not only do I know my sin, but my sin is ever before me. Yes. It, it, it alludes the picture that no matter how much David tries to get away from his sin, his sin is always eating at him. His conscience is dominated by his sin. 
Anybody been there before? Yes. You've done something you had no business doing? Right? right? It, it's one thing to know that you sin. It's another thing to be convicted by your sin. Amen. It's an entirely different thing for what you've done to just eat away at you. When you wake up in the morning, it's on your mind and you're throwing up. When you're on your lunch break, it's on your mind. When you go to bed, your, your pillow is drenched because it's on your mind. But what a scary place it is to be for a person to wrong God and not be convicted yes. by wronging God. Yes, that's right. There's a story about a man that was on vacation. The story says that the man is on vacation and he runs a red light and he kills an elderly woman. Mm -hmm. And he just keeps driving. He drives back home. The story says that this goes on for months. Nobody knows he's done anything. He, he's literally drowning himself in liquor. Breakfast, liquor. Morning, liquor. Lunch, liquor. Dinner, liquor. Dessert, liquor. Story says that one day, this man goes and he turns himself in to the police. When they put him in the holding cell, there's another man in there. And he says, man, why'd you turn yourself in? Nobody would have knew. And he says, no, that's not true. Because I knew and God knew. And we have to get to a place where if nobody else knows about our sin, our sin should convict us. Amen. Our sin should break us. Yes. When you go back to 2 Samuel, when, when you read through 2 Samuel chapter 12, the Bible says that David is literally on the ground crying. He's literally praying. They're trying to get David to eat. He's not eating because he's convicted by his sin. And we can hear this prayer, this pain in his prayer. But there isn't just an acknowledgement of his sin. He isn't just guilted by his sin. But David also recognizes that he needs a fresh start because he was born into sin. And I know I'm moving through the psalm over here and I'm going back over here. But right now I'm strictly dealing with David's sin. Yes. David doesn't just say he sinned. Yes, no, he, he has much more of a, a greater understanding of his sin. He says that his sin goes back to the moment he was born. Here it is in verse 5. He says that, God, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in my sin, and in sin, my mother conceived me. He is not speaking in the way by which he was born, but he is telling God, God, I was born with a spiritual problem. The defect I have is spiritual. It's not physical. Physically, when something is wrong with you, we call it a birth defect. It's a physical or bio not biochemical abnormality that is present at birth and may be inherited as a result of an environmental uh, influence. It can almost uh, affect any part or parts of your body. I did some studying on this. According to the World Health Organization, on average, Eight million newborns are born into this world with a birth defect. The CDC would say that only three to six percent of babies that are born into each year are born with some type of birth defect. And while that may be true, as of January 1st, 2024, according to the census, there are currently eight billion people in this world. And even though only a small percentage is born with a birth defect, I would suggest to you that 100% of the 8 billion people in this world were born with a spiritual effect, and it's called sin. That's right. Amen. If the doctors were to take an x-ray of your spirit when you were born, they would literally see sin growing inside of you. Paul would tell the Roman church like this, by one man's sin or one man's disobedience, many were made sinner. David says that I need a fresh start because I was born into sin, God. Amen. Sin is all I know. And the difference between David and some of us is that David declares it and some of us deny it. Amen. If you were to read through the Alcoholics Anonymous and Narcotics Anonymous manual, the first step to your road in becoming a new person is admitting that you are powerless over your addiction that your life has become unmanageable, yes. it is realizing the reality of the problem mm -hmm. and understanding the nature of the problem. Yes. I would suggest to you this morning 
that David says the first step in him being made a new person, yes. the first step in him being given a fresh start is him openly admitting and confessing to God the reality, the power that sin has over his life and his need for his fresh start. Yes. All right. God, I try, mm -hmm. but on my best day, I'm still a sinner. That's right. That's right. I, I read my Bible every day and I pray every day and I ask you to, to, to give me new thoughts, but my thoughts are still sinful. God, I try, but everywhere I go, sin is following me. I know what's right, but I still find myself doing wrong. And we need to understand that we serve a God that is in the transforming business. Amen. But in order for God to transform you, mm -hmm. in order for God to give you a fresh start, yes. you need to openly acknowledge your need for a fresh start. Yes. But not only does David show us that a fresh start requires an understanding for the need of a fresh start, but he shows us that a fresh start is only passable by the power of God. Yes. As you continue to read through the psalm, just as David uses different words like sin and iniquity and transgression to describe his offense to God, he uses different words to describe the character of God. And as we continue to read, we begin to get the sense that David recognizes that the fresh start that he needs can only be given by God. Here it is. From the start of the prayer, he says, God, be gracious to me. God, I need you. He recognizes that God has the power to give him something that he needs. But the language would suggest that David fully understands that it has nothing to do with who he is, but with everything to do with who God is. He says, be, be gracious to me according to your character, your, your, your loving kindness and the greatness of your compassion. Notice everything that David is asking to be transformed to is predicated by the work of God. Right. He says, God, I want you to remove my iniquity, but it's a result of God washing him. God, remove my sin, but it's a result of God cleansing him. God, make me clean, but it's a result of God purifying him. I want to be whiter than snow, but it's a result of God washing him. David recognizes that the person that he wants to become, the fresh start that he wants, is not possible by his own doing, but is only possible by the power of God. Amen. And what we need is not power that is within ourselves, because the power that is within us is not enough. But in the words of D.A. Carson, what we do need is the power of the sovereign transforming God. Amen. We break it down. Check it out. The moment David realizes that he is flawed in nature, when the prophet Nathan uh, uh, confronts him, David has now been convicted in such a way that he reaches out to God. He asks God to operate on his behalf. David is imperfect, but God is perfect. That means that David is asking a perfect God to operate on the behalf of his imperfection because according to his own might, he is unable to give himself the fresh start that he needs. And he also understands that it's not because of anything that he has done, but it's because of who God is. And I got to stop right there because I wish that, that we would be a people that would openly admit yes. that God operating on our behalf is not because of anything we've done. It's not because of who we are, but it has everything to do with God is. There was nothing you could do to 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 merit the unmerited favor of God. All right. Let me put the shoe on my own foot. I've talked to people all types of ways. I, I've done things that, that I knew were no good. I, I found myself riding in cars that I had no business being in. But God, let me let me press pause and rewind. Let me let me bring it back to David. David recognizes that he committed adultery and murder, which is punishable by death, according to the Levitical law. 
David recognizes that he sinned trying to cover up his sin. But David recognizes that he has nothing inside of himself to bring him back to God. So he asks God to bring him back into relationship with him. Because David realizes who he is. But he also reaches out to God because he knows who he is. He reaches out to a God that tells Moses, I will have mercy on who I have mercy on and I will be compassionate unto who I will show compassion to. I am merciful and gracious, long suffering and abundant in goodness and truth. We have to get to a point where we understand that there is nothing inside of us that is worthy of God giving us a fresh start. There is no strength inside of us that is strong enough to give us a fresh start. There, there, there is no force inside of us that is capable of giving us a fresh start. The only person, the only being capable of giving us a fresh start is God himself. But in that same breath, because God knows, because David knows who God is, because David knows that only God can give him the fresh start that he needs, David also knows that God is just, right. meaning that God cannot just simply overlook what David had done. God cannot just simply withhold punishment from David because sin is offensive to God and God has to punish things that is offensive to him. But here it is. In verse seven, David realizes that in order for God to give him a fresh start, something has to take the place of his punishment. He says here in verse seven, and I'm almost done. He says, purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me whiter as snow. One could argue that verse seven is the most intriguing verse of the entire prayer. Theologian and renowned scholar James Boyce would say that it's the most Important verse, but it's the least understood verse. That's because we don't truly understand that the fresh start that David is asking God for is rooted in God's actions in verse number seven. Brother Ozzy, he says that I want you to purify me with hyssop. A lot of us, we skip over this because we don't truly understand the historical significance of what the hyssop plant was used for. The hyssop plant itself did not heal you, but it was used to, to cover a sacrifice or an offering with blood. If you're, if you're familiar with the narrative in Exodus, when, 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 uh, when Egypt, when the people in Egypt, including the Israelites that are there as well, when they are about to be hit by the plague of death that is sent by God as a result of Pharaoh's rebellion, God tells them to kill over a lamb for the Passover and then to take a bunch of hyssop and then to, to take the hyssop and dip it in blood and to put it over the doorpost. Mm -hmm. And when the angel of the Lord came, when the angel of death came yes. to bring death yes. on the households, yes. death would skip over the households that were hit with the hyssop mm -hmm. with blood because it would signify that something had already took the punishment. Because here it is. Without no blood, there would be no skipping of death. That's right. Without a sacrifice and shedding of blood, there is no cleansing. That's right. Come here, Hebrew writer. The Hebrew writer would say it like this. According to the law, all things were cleansed with blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. That's right. David recognizes that he cannot just be given a, a fresh start based on who he is. Because who he is is what placed him in a position to need the fresh start. Amen. Right. What he did deserves punishment. Right. Yeah. But in verse 7, David openly acknowledges before God that he knows that something has to take the place yeah. of his punishment. That's right. When David says, purify me with hyssop and I shall be clean, wash me whiter as snow, David is literally telling God, I need you to remove my sin. I need you to unsend me with the sin, with the blood of something else. Yes. Ooh, we I could end the sermon right there. Right. Because David 
is not the only person that needed the sacrifice of blood to clean him. That, that there was nothing in David that could give him a fresh start. But everybody in here under the sound of my voice could acknowledge that there was nothing that we could do to bring us back into the presence of God. And so we needed something to take our place. But this time, God didn't give us something, but he gave us someone. This time, it wasn't sprinkled with hyssop. It wasn't the blood of an animal, but it was the blood of Jesus. Come here, Paul. Paul would say it like this. It's in Jesus who we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me whiter than snow. No other fount I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can turn a saint into a sinner? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can turn a person who was powerless in pain to being powerful in person uh, in purpose? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. What can take a person who was broken and put them back together again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. We have to recognize that the blood of Jesus is not because of anything that we've done, but it was given to us because of who God is. And David recognizes an order for him to be given a fresh start. It is because of who God is. Hello, I'm Andrew Braxter, senior servant, the Rose City Community Church of Christ in North Little Rock, Arkansas. I want to begin by expressing my appreciation to our conference founder and director, Dr. Richard Barclay, who not only is our conference founder and director, but he's also my pastor, one that I've looked up to for years. I appreciate so much this opportunity to share in this moment of ministry with the conference, and I pray that this message would be a blessing to us as we look at the playlist journeying through the book of Psalms. What I'd like to do is whisper words of prayer and then invite your attention to Psalm 111. From there, I'll give you a message that God has laid on my heart that I believe is befitting in times like this as we try to find songs to sing during our times that we're living in now. The world that we're living in is one that simply glorifies the things, everything around us. If the things are not right, then we can't find a song to sing. But I pray through this message that we'll be able to find a song to sing simply because of the goodness and the graciousness of our God, simply because of who our God is. Would you bow with me? Father God, we thank you for this moment this opportunity to share words of life with your people. Father, I pray that you would bless this time of sharing. I thank you for another preaching privilege, for a place to preach and for people to preach to, whether in person or in the virtual place. I pray that this message would reach them in their hearts, and I pray that their lives would be changed, made the better because of it. Thank you, God, for being an awesome God. Thank you for being who you are. We love you and we appreciate you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. A very familiar passage of text that is found in the Hebrew hymn book, Psalm 111. I pray that our familiarity with this passage will not cause us to miss what it is the Lord has for us today. Psalm 111, beginning at verse 1, it reads this way from the message translation. Hallelujah. I give thanks to God with everything I've got. 
wherever good people gather and in the congregation. God's works are so great, worth a lifetime of study. Endless enjoyment, splendor, and beauty mark his craft. His generosity never gives out. His miracles are his memorial. This God of grace, this God of love, he gave food to those who fear him. He remembered to keep his ancient promise. He proved to his people that he could do what he said, hand them the nations on a platter, a gift. He manufactures truth and justice. All his products are guaranteed to last. Never out of date, never obsolete, rust proof. All that he makes and does is honest and true. He paid the ransom for his people. King James Version would say he sent redemption to his people. He ordered his covenant forever. He's so personal and holy, worthy of our respect. The good life begins in the fear of God. Do that and you'll know the blessing of God. His hallelujah lasts forever. For the time that is ours to share in this moment, I want to simply talk from the subject, reasons. 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 As we look in this year's conference and as we talk about the different songs that we sing as we journey throughout the Psalms, it's good to know that the book of Psalms Psalms was literally the Hebrew hymn book. There are songs that they would sing when they would go into the church. There are songs for every, every occasion. And being a musical person myself, I always find myself singing. Uh, songs that make me feel good, songs that make me smile. I found a song for every occasion, songs when I'm sad. If you will remember back in the day on Saturday mornings, we would wake up to the sounds of blues as it was time to clean the house. On Sunday mornings, we would be listening to the sounds of the old church as we prepared for worship. There were literally songs for every occasion. And I praise God for the gift of music. I praise God for the songs that we sing. As a matter of fact, it was Gardner C. Taylor that said how impoverished the world would be if the church never learned how to sing. And so may I just say from the beginning of this little message today that you ought to find a song to sing no matter where you are in life because there is power in music. There is power in songs. There is something sacred about singing. And so I praise God just to be able to talk about the Psalms and to be able to sing the songs of Zion in this year because if we've ever needed a real song to sing, now is the time. When we speak about God, so many times we talk about what he does and all about the, the blessings that he has given us, the things that he has given us. And it has become easy for us to sing those type of songs based off of the stuff that God has given us. You've made a way, you paid a bill, you kept a roof over my head. And I praise God today for the things that he has done. But this psalm teaches us a little something different. This is a deeper meaning psalm that God is so much bigger than the stuff that he gives. God is so much bigger than just the blessings he gives. God is a God who is more than just blessings and stuff and substance. He is sovereign over all. And if you can't find a reason to sing about anything else deeper than the stuff that God gives you, deeper than the blessings that you feel like you have, you ought to be able to sing just because God is who he is. He is sovereign ruler. He is supreme being. Just because he is God, you ought to find a reason to sing today. A friend of mine by the name of Harold Wade Jr. 
wrote a song to which I have titled this little presentation after simply called Reasons. And in that song that he has written, he talks about the worthiness of God. He talks about the honor of God. He talks about the gloriness, uh, the, the gloriousness of God. And because he is all of those things, it simply makes him worthy to be praised such as the discourse and the discipline that is discovered here in Psalm 111. The psalmist simply talks about how worthy God is, how awesome God is, how amazing God is, even before you get to the stuff, even before you get to the blessings, even before you get to the tangible things of God, simply because of who God is, God is worthy to be praised. There are a couple of things I want to tell you about this little passage. And then I'll sign off. I'm, I'm thankful today. These are, these are the reasons why I sing of God. These are the reasons why I praise God. These are the reasons why I love God. Number one, I love God because of what he does. And may I just submit this to you today as we move through this, that in, in, in the Christian life, you move through different phases of faith. You move through different moments of faith where your faith begins at an immature level and then it grows to a mature level. Matter of fact, even the songs that we sing in life begin at an immature place. They begin with simple things, but they hold deep truths as you get a little bit older. We learn our ABCs, but not realizing the ABC song is really teaching us our alphabet. And the alphabet is going to teach us words for which we will shape our lives. But it gets deeper and deeper as you get more and more mature. So watch this. I'm thankful uh, to God. I'm thankful for God simply, number one, because of what he does. I thank God for what he does. And I wonder, is there anybody that can thank God with me simply for what he does? We serve a God that does more for us than we could ever imagine. We serve, we serve a God who can do more for us than we can ever think. As a matter of fact, nobody can do us like he can. He woke you up this morning. That's a shout right there. He started you on your way. That's another shout right there. You can put one foot in front of the other. You are in your right mind. You've got a roof over your head. You've got a place to go and work. You've got food to eat. You've got clothes to put on your back. You ought to thank God for what he does. And whereas we thank God many times, for the things that he does, those things that we can see, those things that we can feel. There are so many things that are invaluable, things that cannot even be touched, but God just keeps on doing it. I, I, I didn't understand it growing up, but now as I've gotten a little bit older and I've been through some things in life, I understand now what it means for God to be a mind regulator, for God to be a company keeper, for him to be the peace that passes all understanding those are things that money cannot buy and because God is so great I'm thankful not just for the stuff that I can see and feel but I'm thankful for those things that I have to keep in my heart what an awesome God what an amazing God we serve because of what he does Watch this. The psalmist begins by saying, hallelujah, I give thanks to God with everything I've got. Wherever good people gather and in the congregation, the psalmist says, wherever I go, I'm going to give God praise because he is worthy of it. Verse 2 says, God's works are so great. They are worth a lifetime of study. And when you study them for a lifetime, they will bring you endless enjoyment, which means the more I study a about the goodness of God, the more I think about what God has done, the more I'm going to thank him for who he is. And I wonder, is there anybody that can just do a flashback, hit rewind in your life and start thinking about all of the good things that God has done, all of the ways that he's made, all of the doors that he has opened. We serve a God who does so much more. And the more you start flashing back, you'll have a flash forward and you'll start thanking him for all that he's done it's endless enjoyment it's it's something that brings a constant smile to your face because you're thinking about the good things that God has done but once you move 
past the stuff. Uh, once you move past the stuff, the biggest thing, the biggest thing that we can shout off of is not just that he's fought our battles, not just that he has made our enemies our footstool, not just that he has put food on our table and clothes on our back, but the thing that should shout us the most is what verse number nine says. And if you miss verse number nine, you miss the entire being of the psalm and why it was written. Watch this. He sent redemption unto his people. Let me try you again. I know you're at home. I know you're at work. Wherever you may be watching this, I know it really just went over you. You ought to shout today because God sent redemption to his people. You're still asleep. Let me try you one more time. You ought to shout today because God sent redemption to his people. Why, Brack, should I shout today? Because he sent redemption to his people. Because if he would not have sent redemption to his people, the clothes on your back wouldn't matter. The food on your table wouldn't matter. The roof over your head would not matter if your soul was not saved. And so whereas you can thank God that you have a roof over your head, you have a car to drive, you have a job to go to you have food at the house you have clothes to put on your nasty self listen if he did not save your sin sick soul none of that stuff would matter and so more than anything the Lord has saved my soul and since the Lord has saved my soul that is reason enough for me to be thankful for him because the Lord has saved my soul he has made me whole he has picked me up turned me around placed my feet on solid ground I thank God for sending redemption to his people we were on our way to a burning hell we had been sold to the lowest bidder but he comes and he pays the highest price and he sends redemption to his people and that's what God does God redeems his people. God saves his people for the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life. He who knew no sin became sin that we might become the righteousness of God. That's what God does. He saves me. He creates in me a clean heart, renews in me a right spirit. But not only am I thankful for what God does, this is, this is where we move in our faith. Uh, we are, we're, we're thankful for what he does, but I'm, I'm also thankful for how God is designed. I'm, I'm, I'm thankful for how God is designed. If you're not mature in your faith, this one may scare you. It, it, it may perplex you a little bit. But there's something about the design of God, the D-E-S-I-G-H-N of God, how he is designed that makes me want to sing to him. Watch this. Watch this. David says, the psalmist says, he, he sent redemption unto his people. He paid the ransom for his people. He ordered his covenant to be kept forever. Watch this. Watch this. The psalmist not only says he paid the ransom for his people and he ordered his covenant to be kept forever, but the next part is the one that is perplexing, but it makes me shout over his design. He's personal and holy. He's personal and holy. He is personal and holy. He's personal and holy. It's really oxymoronic. He is personal. He's a personal God. But he is a holy God. He is a personal God, but he is a holy God. He is a personal God, but he is a holy God. Here's the issue. This is the reason why it's oxymoronic to me. This is why it doesn't make sense, but it makes me shout. The personalness of God draws him close to me. But the holiness of God draws him away from me. Because God is so holy... I should not be able to coexist or dwell in the same place as him because he is a holy God. And anything that is holy cannot dwell in the same place with a thing that is unholy. We are unholy humanity. Our sin separates us from God. 
It, 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 it separates us from God. It creates a great gap in between us and our God. But though our sin separates us from God, he has found a way for him to come close to us. Because he is a holy God and because I am sinful man, I should not be able to come into his presence because the smell of my sin disgusts him. It makes him nauseous. It makes him sick to his stomach. He is so holy. He has asked his people to be holy for I am holy. He wants us to imitate his holiness. He encourages us to walk in a place of holiness. As a matter of fact, he's so holy. He's so beautiful. His his, 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 his splendor, his, his presence is, is so awesome that even when he is talking with Moses, Moses asks, can I see you? And he tells him, listen, if I allow you to see my face because I am so holy, it will literally kill you. The holiness on me will kill the hell that's in you. So he says, what I'll do for you because I cannot allow you to see my face because it's too much for you to handle. I'll cover your face and I'll pass in front of you and I'll allow you to see my backside. And even the backside of God was too much because he's so holy. But watch this, watch this, watch this. Although he's so holy, although he's so awesome, although his splendor is so much, matter of fact, He's so holy that when we get on the other side, when we get to the other side and we sit around the throne of God, we will sing a song about the holiness of God and the song will only have one word. It will be holy, 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 holy. As a matter of fact, God is so holy that there are 24 elders that are surrounding the throne that have taken off their crowns and have thrown them at his feet because in the presence of this holy God, they are nothing. He's holy. Oh, but in all of his holiness, the psalmist says he's personal. That shouts me. That makes me want to sing because even though he is a holy God, he is still a personal God. And you ought to thank God today that in the midst of all of his holiness, in the midst of all of his gloriousness, in the midst of simply who he is, he's still not too far that he cannot reach you. He's holy. Yet he's personal. As a matter of fact, John put it this way, John chapter 1 and verse number 14. And the word became flesh, dwelt among us, and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Watch this. He who knew no sin became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. And I wonder, is there anybody that can thank God today? Is there anybody that can thank God right where you are that even in the midst of all of his holiness and in all of his perfectness and all of who he is, he still found a place to be personal with you. The Hebrews writer put it this way, for we have not a high priest who cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, but he was tempted in all aspects just like we are yet without sin. Literally, the son of God became the son of man so that the sons of men could become the sons of God. That is his holiness and his humanity coming together as one so that we can be reconciled back to him. And that's good news. That's simply how he is designed. He is designed to be holy yet personal, which is why he can incline his ear to you, which is why he can get on your level and reach you right where you are. And because God can reach you right where you are, that is reason enough for you to sing to him. But then lest I hold you too long, not only am I thankful and it's my reason being because of what he does. Not only am I thankful and my reason because of his design. Thirdly and finally, 
I have a reason to be thankful to him and I have a reason to sing because of his duration. I, 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 have, a, I have a reason to sing because of his duration, not only because of what he does, because at some point you have to move beyond the things that God just does. Another part of his design, his holiness is a part of his sovereignness. And he does things simply just because he is God. So I'm thankful that he is a sovereign God who no matter if my life is going the way I want it to or not, because he is a sovereign God, I know everything is going to be all right. It's all working for my good, but also for his glory. But thirdly and finally, I'm thankful for his duration. I'm, I'm thankful. I'm I'm thankful for his duration. Verse, verse 5 says, he gave food to those who fear him, and he remembered to keep his ancient promise. I, I want to tell you that God is a promise-keeping God. God is a promise-keeping God. God is a promise-keeping God. He remembers to keep his ancient promise. He proved to his people that he could do just what he said. And can I tell you, he didn't just do it one time. He did it over and over again and again. What did he do? He handed them nations on a silver platter as a gift. He manufactured truth and justice. Watch this. All all of his products are guaranteed to last. They never go out of date. They are never obsolete. They are rust proof. Literally, I thank God and I sing to God today because everything that he does is built to last. When you give it over to God, you don't have to worry about it breaking down again. When you give it over to God, you don't have to worry about it rusting out or running out. God, what he does is give it to you and it will last a lifetime. Even if it's not a run over, it will never run out because what he does is meant to last. As you read throughout the Psalms and as we've been going throughout this conference, I'm certain that you have been hearing that his love endures forever. His mercy endures forever. And I want to tell you that everything about God it will endure forever so you ought to thank God that we serve a God who does not have an expiration date you ought to thank God that we serve a God who will not run out who will never get tired who will not give in who will not give up because everything about him it lasts forever so go on and sing your song today because his love lasts forever go on and sing today because his mercy endures forever. Go ahead and sing today because his grace lasts forever. Go ahead and sing today because his salvation lasts forever and he will last forever. And one of these days when we close our eyes on this side and we wake up on the other side, we will live with him forever. So I've got to close this little message, but I want to tell you today that you have a reason to thank God. You have a reason to sing to God and it's simply because of what he does it's simply because of how he's designed but most of all it's because we serve a God that will last forever and one of these days we'll be around the throne singing a song of God that will last forever we'll be enjoying eternity in his splendor because all of the saints of God will be with him forever so as I leave you may the Lord bless you real good I have a question for you have you any rivers that sing uncrossable? Have you any mountains that you cannot tunnel through? Can I tell you that my God specializes in things that seem impossible and he will do what no other power can do. That's what he does. That's how he designed. That's how he is designed and most of all he has fixed it and it will last forever. And those are the reasons, those are the reasons that I sing. Those are the reasons why I sing my song. I sing because I'm happy. I sing because I'm free. His eye is on the sparrow, and I know he watches me. It's what he does. It's how he's designed. 
but it's how he will last forever and ever. God, thank you. Thank you, God, for being a God that will last forever. Thank you for saving our soul. Thank you for making us whole. And thank you in the midst of your holiness. Thank you for touching our humanity through your sovereignty. And just as you love us forever, may we live for you forever. You by yourself are reason enough to sing. Thank you in Jesus' name.